Thank you for coming out so early to listen to us talk about heavy metal, um, first of all. The premise of this paper really is um, for me to highlight some of the sort of technological development that's changed the way producers need to work with heavy metal music. Um, it sort of comes out of my, my doctoral thesis and, and uh, an article that's forthcoming. Um, but what I want to talk about is the way in which technology permeates the production process and how this is meant for many that there's the employment of a fragmented and often quite anxious approach to making heavy metal music in the studio. Um, I also want to explore slightly the discourse of heavy metal record producers and how this discourse impacts on sort of our current understanding of production methodologies. So the intent of this paper is not to look at the role of the producer. This has been done widely. Um, if I use the term producer throughout, it's, it's with an understanding that the producer is more commonly also an engineer, possibly also a musician, those kind of roles. Um, if, you, if you need more information on that, I suggest going and seeing Richard James Bird's work. Um, before I also jump into this, I want to kind of um, define my, my use of the term heavy metal. And I know that in heavy metal musicology, uh, this has kind of been bounded around as quite a hot topic. Um, and Mark's work particularly sort of talks about contemporary metal music. Um, and I want to kind of separate out what I'm going to talk about from Mark's work here. Um, so the study that I'm going to talk about draws from a very broad timeline. Um, it doesn't particularly focus on any kind of um, particular genre of heavy metal music. So I'm still using this quite broad term at this point. Um, for a sort of understanding of the kind of things that the production methodologies we're talking about, Marx but particularly talks about defining uh, contemporary metal music um, as this kind of uh, defined by heaviness and being primarily substantiated through displays of distortion and regardless of the listening levels involved, the fundamentals of this identity are inherently linked to volume, power, energy, intensity, emotionality, and aggression. The final thing just to introduce is, why is it strange? Well, as, as I move through this, I hope it becomes more apparent that for me, it's an issue of authenticity and record making. Um, as, as we, as producers, are we capturing a performance or are we enhancing that performance? Um, and for the reasons explored in this paper, I think heavy metal presents a strange but not unique case. So the study itself then, um, it, it drew on the lived experiences of seven renowned producers. Now I, I did set out to not create a production methodology. This has been done already very successfully by a number of authors. Um, it was more about understanding how record producers are working with this type of music in the recording studio setting. Now as part of this lived experience, a deeper understanding of technological motivations and the experience of using technology as part of the creative process was required, so this was one of the key things I was looking to explore with my participants. It was key for me to understand you know, how, this is, how, how this is informed practice, as well as our understanding of metal music in the studio. Uh, conceptually, this draws on the interplay between technological determinism and instrumentalism. So, some of the key outcomes for me were the dichotomy between potential and anticipated use of technology, and this is what I'm going to explore in a lot more detail today. But it was also about um, identifying a key set of what I determine as genre specific production aesthetics. So, somewhat different from Mark's work. Um, it's about impact, precision, extremity, and energy. Now, these exist um, not only as audible artifacts, but as a kind of social cultural artifact in the studio. And broadly, you know, there was an, an additional aim at the outset to kind of join up some of the avenues that are explored in kind of metal studies, um, organization, and some of the work that ARP is doing. So what do I mean by fragmented production? Well, recorded heavy metal music has been identified to have changed. We can see that over time in terms of levels of extremity, the way it is produced in such kind of defined ways. Um, it's, it's not so much in its audible qualities though, like timbre or musical attributes or performance aspects. Those are still traditionally quite the same as you know, early Black Sabbath records, but it's in the way it's made in the studio. 
it's been a monumental shift away from recording live or, or bands in a live fashion. Recording heavy metal is now a fragmented process and this has distinct advantages and disadvantages. And I kind of want to point to Shannon's work from 1995 when he talks about the issue of fragmentation in multi-track recording as a result of the, the development of multi-track tape machines. So here the term live suggests that recording a whole band at the same time. So Shannon talks about before multi-track and the objective was to do a series of takes and he had enough to be able to assemble a definitive version with editing. The key element here, by the same token, however, the essential activity of the musician, the performance of music, becomes more and more fragmented. So with that in mind, heavy metal really is no longer a live phenomena in the recording studio. You know, we can see this in sort of Sabbath's debut album. This was recorded over two days on a four track tape machine um, with very minimal overdubs. The fragmentation in this case is very different to Mark's idea of fragmentation, um, which alludes to the specific sonic aesthetics of the various subgenres of heavy metal music. And this is kind of where I point to Eisenberg, who suggests that through plurality concepts, just as a beauty in the art of phonography, it captures musical performances, often from instruments that are bitches to play. Now I can link this quite explicitly to metal performance. Um, which plays on extremity and tempi and dynamics, um, often making them a total bitch to play. So as, as an indicator of how the sort of development of multi-track technology began to in influence heavy metal music, I had, one of my first participants in the study was Tom Allen, who you noted here is actually Tony Allen. Um, and he was one of the engineers on the first three Black Sabbath records as well as numerous uh, Jewish Priest records moving forward. Um, and he talks about this excitement of, of being in the studio with Black Sabbath and only having a four track tape machine. And then he started talking about Paranoid and this is where I kind of got excited and the, the metal fan of me was really out of place at the time you know, talking to him. And um, he talks about how when they came back to record Paranoid about six months after the first record, the studio manager could see the potential in what they were doing hired in another four track tape machine, allowing them to double track guitars and actually record drums with more microphones than just two. So you can see exactly where heavy metal gets its kind of sonic uh, constructions from and how it creates this idea of excitement with, with the people that are making that music in the studio and, it, and it's traceable all the way back through its history. Throughout the interviews, and I'm gonna go on to explore that in a bit more detail, this, this developing nature of modern techno technology is the focal point for all of the participants. Particularly its non-linearity with the advent of digital audio workstations. And whilst the development of recording technology from a linear to non-linear process may be a fairly obvious observation, um, and it has been documented by many authors, it's, it has particular ramifications for recorded heavy metal music, the double track guitar for one. So to understand this a little better, I wanted to, to explore heaviness and what it actually meant in, in the kind of phenomenological realm. So my uh, definition of heaviness is kind of seminal for this work. Um, we think about the fundamentals of identity that they're ecologically linked to volume, power, energy, and intensity. What was slightly interesting for me, and I found this quite early on in my research, is that we have this puzzle and this is set out by Berger and Fels, and the puzzle, in other words, is this. Metalheads affirm that they hear a quality X, or heaviness. That defines the genre that contains it, a genre that must demonstrate greater X, and that must increase in Xness over time. Now, I would suggest that this audible phenomenon, heaviness, is socially, culturally, and technologically constructed. If we take this puzzle that Berger and Fels set out and apply this to the technological experience of producing heavy metal music, what is X? If producers of heavy metal here, quality X, heaviness, are they then looking to demonstrate greater amounts of X, of, of heaviness? And is this achieved through technology? Likewise, if we study the development of technology used within heavy metal production, what is X? What is the quality when considering technology that defines heaviness or the process by which this audible phenomenon is achieved? So, Spending time thinking about this, for me it was about the anticipation of heaviness. 
and how kind of metal subculture feeds us with this puzzle. You know, fan forums and, and fed by actually the artists themselves talking about, well, our next record will be the heaviest yet. You know, this kind of subculture of, well, and, and actually self-satisfying subcultural kind of connotations of, well, if a heavy metal record is to be successful, it has to be heavier than what came before it. For producers, this forces them down this kind of um, very fine line of, of quite an anxious production process, which I, I determined to be kind of prescriptive production, which we'll explore. So recording heavy metal music is a product of a number of working practices. This is evident in the work of Mark Minot uh, and the, the comprehensive production methodologies of the genre with Turner and Williams as well. The methodology acknowledges the extensive use of technology and the repetition of sonic aesthetics and also focuses on a technologically reinforced performance practice. So it kind of reinforces this idea of prescriptive production. There is an accepted production methodology. Now this is one of the things that I tried to explore with my participants and actually found quite difficult. They, they, they couldn't quite grasp the idea that what they were doing was part of this, this larger thing. Um, importantly, as a, as a jumping off point, it is defying contemporary me metal music and there's a, the idea that something is required from the production of this genre. So the study itself then, I conducted semi-structured interviews with, with seven renowned producers and actually out of this was really useful. I ended up working with quite a few of them on sessions and kind of shaped the research in a slightly different way. Um, it, it really showcased you know, a huge amount of rich data, which still, three years, four years on from actually collecting this data, is still wielding new perspectives for me every time I revisit it. And it was important for me to, to really capture kind of a sense of the wide range of, of heavy metal production. Now, there are, they are all UK based, so this, this, this study does assume that this is a UK, um, geographically this is based in the UK, any results of this. One of the interesting things when I plotted their kind of working timeline, obviously we've got Tom Allen in the Senate here who's been working ever since the kind of birth of heavy metal, if you will, um, is that they all kind of coincide around the turn of the century. Now, I, do, I just suppose and propose actually that this is probably to do with digital technology in the studio and the, and the advent of the DAW. It, can, it becomes more accessible for us to make this music. Um, and also that democratized technology really shifts heavy metal up a gear at this point in time. Now, I use a, a method called interpretive phenomenological analysis. And I, I won't go into the deep-rooted kind of philosophical history of this or background. Essentially, it's a qualitative research approach committed to the examination of how people make sense of major life experiences, and it asks them to reflect on these experiences. Um, it, it allows for observed and recorded experience to be categorized independent of any pre-existing categorical approach. So whilst providing a focus on personal meaning and sense-making in a particular context, for people who share a particular experience. So, the shared experience here is making heavy metal music in the studio using technology. So each of the interviews, and there was 30 plus hours of this, was coded um, through a, a process of, of double reading, um, with emergent themes being noted on a first reading, exploratory comments also kind of supplementing what was doing. So this is an extract from the interview of Dave Chang. Um, and you can see what the kind of things I'm looking for. I'm kind of trying to summarise what he's saying, but also pick out the key words uh, throughout. The key thing about IPA is it employs interpretation. So not only am I asking my participants to interpret their experience, I'm then interpreting their experience again. And I have to use my kind of um, my background as, as as an engineer, but also from an academic point of view to, to kind of make sense of what they're doing. There are a couple of key steps here, so reading and rereading, exploratory comments, etc. Um, but it's all about looking for patterns across the cases. I apologise for this clumsy example. However, it does kind of show you the kind of the. This was all after my first reading, and this was all of the emergent themes that I came up with. It took me quite a while to kind of like condense this down into a number of, um, of usable kind of um, emergent themes. So after that, 
process of rereading the data is all about impact, energy, precision, and extremity. If I had more time, I would love to talk about these in much more detail. So what I'm going to do is move forward through into the kind of outcomes of the study in much more detail and show you some of these examples. One of the things that was apparent right from the start is that for the producers and the participants of the study, it was all about size and creating records that sounded huge or were big or um, linked to, linking size to excitement and size to power. Um, now these examples highlight size as one aspect and it's particularly metaphoric, um, but it's, it's how it triggers excitement throughout the discourse and it does it in slightly different ways. For some it was conceptual, some it was literal, and others it was directly related to technology. So Mike Exeter talking about working with Black Sabbath, it's all about making things sound huge. So it's quite conceptual. For Ramesh Dode Angola, it's about very particular and literal things he can do to create excitement within his, within his work. For Oz Krags, it's explicitly linked to his use of technology. You know, he, he talks about being able to use EQ to create stuff, uh, to make things bigger. Now, this was a key moment for me. Um, this was when I realized that, that the whole process of making heavy metal in the studio was much bigger than what I, what I understood in terms of current production, production methodologies. Uh, so before the two major outcomes, it was, it was Russ Russell's words that kind of, in, it made me think about a value system within this process. Perfect records never excite me. There's, I won't say I don't like perfect records, but it's more sort of impressive technical exercise rather than a good album. So he's juxtaposing the idea of creating something quite technical and which contemporary metal music can often be with the idea of a good album, a musical artifact. So for us, it, you know, in this clip, it's about perfection this link more commonly has with technicality. I think it's a link to practice. So as music producers, do we, uh, do we think of music production as a toolkit in which the tools are built to do very exact and predetermined roles? I think that the participants saw technology as more closely aligned with instrumentalism, seeing technology as a tool to get from point A to point B, and they were much more concerned with the kind of musical um, context that was in between point A and point B. Technology has here multiple uses, and, and this is constructed by the user, you know, as, as per Thingberg. So the two major outcomes start to really take shape here. It's about the potential and the anticipations caused by technology or used by technology. Dave Chang talks about it in, in terms of technological democratization. You know, it's about helping musicians realize their, their kind of sound they're aiming for in a very budget-friendly way. The other thing that he points out is quite interesting is they understand the, pr the production process and this is what the democratization of technology has done for heavy metal production. Oz was a very interesting case because he, he spent a lot of time talking about drum production and, and that was something that it comes across throughout the, the study but he talks about um, the kick drum having to sound a certain way, so it's coming back to this idea of required sound. Um, it, uh, interestingly, he juxtaposes the idea that he never wants to be the guy with the presets, yet he completely understands that you have to do things a certain way to be of the ilk. Um, you know, this idea of success, and there was a, a, a great talk yesterday about the idea that if, if, if no one put, you know, we, um, we have to do things a certain way in music production, we don't get the work. And there's this kind of underlying undertone there. And this is all about the potential of technology, but also the anticipations that artists are bringing to these producers. So here's where I ended up. Um, the process of, of making a heavy metal record is defined by these two conceptual um, elements. The idea that the potential use of technology is the use of technology that maintains a producer's vision and fulfills the desired recorded aesthetic. So here, technology transcends beyond its intended use, or indeed its use is marketed or promoted by manufacturers. The anticipated use of technology here, you know, you can think about this as metal by numbers. Um, artists primarily have agency 
it's the use of technology is supported by a recorded aesthetic and the artist's vision of recorded aesthetic. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Niall. Okay, we've got um, seven minutes for questions, so um, who wants to go? Yeah, well, yeah. I, really, I mean, I, I really like the methodologies and the examples you gave were, were great, but I, I mean, this is a short presentation, yeah. but, but they're quite, the comments are quite vague, you know, I use drums, uh, talking about a good record, I want things to sound huge, so do you also, did you also manage with your interviews to get into how they do that, I mean, how they make things sound huge using keyboards, how they yeah. make drum sounds? So, one of the problems with using IPA is that it, it assumes that you've got a lot of time to talk to your participants and a lot of these interviews last about four hours so there was this it, to, to really drill down to those kind of um, core components of what their production was about technically um, took a lot of teasing out and actually because it was semi-structured it encourages them to really reflect and you're encouraged not to prod them for specifics you know let them vocalize their experience. Often that stuff didn't come through. And in the end, I actually found, found myself kind of not worrying too much about specifics. You know, it's the one, the example is from Russ Russell, he talks about making perfect records. That actually was a, a really important point in the study because it made me think that actually this is less about understanding the EQ curve on a kick drum or which samples they're using or how they're reinforcing and editing drums or um, how they're layering guitars and how the EQ works across their buses, all those kind of things, which are well documented, first of all, and also well documented across fan forums, you know, production forums, resources like Nail the Mix. It was more about the experience of making that record. Um, so it wasn't necessarily about drilling down to those kind of specifics with them. It was more about understanding their role um, and, and how their perception of technology has changed the way they're making records. I think it would be interesting, I think, for a, a, a whole, I mean, for, sort of for the whole, the totality of your work when it's you know, collected together to have some of those details that yeah. may be in the public domain and they may be out there yeah. and they're not collected together in a place where, and they're not in the academic, they're yeah. not published in the academic world. So to some communities, they're not available. Yeah, sure. So that might be something you could, you could have links to or something yeah. in your work at some point would be really interesting. Yeah, no, I think about it. Mark, you had a question or a comment? Yeah, um, I think it's the idea, um, the different producers from the different times, um, and Mike Exeter and Tom Allen, did you get a sense of what they inject into the process rather than the, what they've taken from working in the analog yeah. domain, not just the analog domain equipment wise, but the whole mentality that comes with it about the decision making process, I think is fascinating. And did you get a very different sense of when they work with these producers that are tape guys, if you will, versus the new breed of digital guys of the aesthetics of the way that they make albums and the way they approach the performances. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the issues with working with such renowned producers was that they've, they've got quite unique cases and they're talking about fans which can afford, first of all, to make big records. Yeah. You know, excuse the use of the term big, but they can afford to spend two years at Shangri-La yeah. recording a record. Um, and actually, I think that, that Mike Exeter and Tom Allen particularly, and that comes out in the study, you know, by bookending heavy metal as we understand it in terms of its, its chronology, they talk about the similar things, you know, just wanting the band to actually record life and, and how 13 was produced compared to the way the early Sabbath records were. They, they wanted to get back to that and that's well documented yeah. in popular journalism. Um, Mike Exeter is a unique case in the fact that he talks about Pro Tools as an analog tool. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if that particularly answers your question, but I don't. It's really difficult for me to comment on that because the study doesn't really take into account bedroom producers or sure. young producers who are working with very limited amounts of technology yeah. and, and how that would compare to yeah. Got, uh, these types of producers. But that's interesting because it, because you you're using a platform doesn't determine how it's used. No. It's like just because you're using Photoshop, you might just do no. some simple color correction. You know, not 
creating so you, like you say you can yeah. use Pro Tools like a tape machine. Yeah. If, if I, you want. I mean, I've, just quickly, there's there's something that uh, may may you may want to think about in terms of this is that again, Russ Russell talks about it as, as this kind of negative but also positive impact of technology. You know, he talks about the idea that. The way these records are made is so time consuming and we have to edit, we have to quantize everything because it's expected of these producers. Yeah. However, what it's doing for younger generations of musicians is incredible. Yeah. So he talks about um, you know, sixteen year old speed metal drummers, you know, yeah. thrash metal drummers, you know, influenced by bands like Napalm Death and all those kind of things coming in, being able to perform at two hundred and forty BPM with consistent dynamics over the course of three or four days. Yeah. And yeah. so there is this there's a really unique case here that heavy metal production is informing performance. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah which I'm not quite true. sure is apparent in other genres. I don't know. Someone feel free to correct me, but I think this is quite a unique case. The University of Huddersfield, inspiring tomorrow's professionals.